just as a, a bit of an introduction, my name is Richard Paul. I work in the School of Education and, and Sociology, and I'm the, the course leader for the uh, one of the master's programmes there after our collaborative provision and degree apprenticeships. So part of my um, rationale, or part of my raison d'etre within the school is to, I look after the distance learning uh, master's programme and we have approximately 140 students uh, on the programme from, from countries around the world. Um, so I've, I've been looking after this programme now for uh, almost 18 months. So I come from a, a relatively fledgling position of experience in terms of working with uh, distance learning programmes um, and, and, the, and the benefits and the limitations that they have, really. So a um, bit of a caveat, <clears throat> sorry, excuse me, before I begin, um, there is absolutely, and I'm, I'm sure you'll agree with most things, there's, there's no right or wrong answer of any of this. Um, and this is just my perspective, my take, uh, and some of the things that have, I found that have worked and some of the things that I found that haven't worked. So what I'd like to do today is, um, well, actually, I'm going to kick the presentation if that's okay. Um, you're going to have to forgive me slightly. I don't generally tend to use WebEx, so I just want to make sure we're in the right place with things. So hopefully, all being well, you should now see uh, a picture of me in the corner and a, and a slide and a screen. So I'd like to just ask a, a, a rhetorical question just to start, if that's okay. Um, in terms of your... Um, your experience, you know, if you think think about online learning and, and a TV documentary, for example, a TV documentary can hold your attention, hold an audience's attention for an hour. But actually, why can't online lectures and, and videos uh, hold student attention for more than the, the mythical four minutes that we have? So I don't want an answer, but I just want you to think about that. Think about a good documentary that you've seen, you know, that, that holds you, you know, engages you fully for, for a period of time. But actually, why mythically, why can't we do that with our students? What's what's the, the issue there? So um, in terms of uh, question there, <laughs> in terms of the structure of the session, um, what I'd like to do is, is discuss a little bit of the theory behind blended learning and distance learning uh, and the sense of community. I won't spend a huge amount of time on that, but just to, to set the scene, really. Um, and then look at what theory tells us we should do uh, and what should work, but then uh, give you a, a tangible example of a, a VLE structure that I've uh, put in place and my team utilise um, that hopefully uh, facilitates uh, a distance learning community, an online community. So, what do we know about campus-based delivery? Now, you're all au okay with this, I'm sure, and uh, some of the things that, in, in terms of a sense of community and, and that... Um, environment of that learning environment is that we know that interaction is constant between between us as, as teaching staff as students and with their peers as well and because of that they encounter encounter feedback regularly so there's constant feedback and that's a, a key aspect which we'll come on to to shortly not only do they have the opportunity for constant feedback but also there's numerous opportunities for collaboration again peer-to-peer -peer, but also teach staff uh, to peer and, and other stakeholders as well like learning development tutors uh, and librarians and this you know, interaction, this opportunity for collaboration enables relationships to be formed, which is, you know, as human beings within the sector of education, for me, this is, this is paramount. Um, and because of these relationships, you know, a community is present. You know, students have an identity. They are part of a community. And therefore, learning is, is, is much more uh, amiable and, and, and can occur in a more straightforward and traditional fashion. We all know that. So how does this differ from, from distance learning? Well, there are pedagogical differences in terms of uh, delivering taught material online at, at a distance when compared with campus-based delivery. Um, and actually what happens is this can be a lonely place for, for students. A DL can be a lonely place. Um, and universities need to create high quality digital content suitable expressing learning uh, in an efficacious way through, through an online material for these students. because. Otherwise, a lack of you know, interaction can lead to a, a, a lower sense of community um, and the perception of, of learning is less. You know, there's research uh, by Moore in 2014 that discovered although students were actually learning as much in terms of outcomes, when compared to, to campus-based learning, the, the distance learning student, students perceived that their, their, their learning was, was less, which is, which is not where we need to be. And validation of learning is key. You know, this is developing a sense of community um, you know, is a challenge because human to human interactions are, are limited uh, and prominence needs to be placed on reducing any feelings of isolation or any feelings of distance. 
And without those interactions, students can't have their learning validated. They don't know if they're going in the right direction. Um, so they can't validate their progress against others. You know, they, they don't know what they're studying is correct, what they're, they're writing in essays is correct. You know, the research they're doing is right. And they need feedback to be able to do this. And without that learning community, the opportunities for feeding, uh, so for feedback are, are very limited. Uh, and as we know, the work by, by John Hattie um, over numerous years, but certainly his work in 2014, identifies feedback as a, an absolutely crucial element, you know, um, a factor that hugely influences uh, achievement. In fact, it was in the top 10. So we need this, this sense of, of community, of this validation. Now, because of this, there are some, some issues with, with distance learning delivery. Um, there's difficulty uh, and anxiety that, that people have with not only delivering online seminars, but also being part of them. You know, to, to put your hand up in an online seminar and ask a question can be just as daunting and, and as scary to put your hand up in a, in a seminar, you know, a live campus based one if you're, if you're not that kind of extrovert personality. So there are some difficulties with that, just getting the engagement there. Also, there's, there's issues of engagements with, with videos, with online um, uh, video content. Um, and it tends to be this low engagement, this mythical four minutes of, 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 of attention span is, is a problem with that. Uh, and as we've just you know, I've recently mentioned, yeah, there's a lack of community and because of this, this, this is an issue. Now, there are um, other inhibiting factors, uh, such as time and life commitments that get in the way for, for people that are uh, distance learning, um, especially across differing time zones. Yeah, this can accentuate uh, the issue by, by students being in different parts of the world, which makes online uh, and live synchronous uh, delivery very, very challenging. Those are all from a, um, a student's participant's perspective, but actually, as you'll no doubt be aware, to create high quality uh, digital resources and online material is actually more time consuming than creating you know, a face-to-face -face, uh, lecture or, or seminar. There are some, some elements around here. So in terms of, of the, the session today, in terms of um, the direction of the focus really, what we'll be focusing on is that, that classroom community and how we develop that potentially at distance. So as I mentioned, um, research shows that validation of learning and a sense of community is, is essential for, for distance learning endeavors. We, we have to put this in place to, to develop what we've got. Um, and research in, in 2002 um, by Rovo, postulates that classroom community consists of four different dimensions um, and they're listed there for you know, spirit, trust, interaction and learning. Um, this is based on, on campus-based delivery. So to develop those you know, face to face, human to human, as we mentioned before, because of the opportunities for collaboration, interaction and, and constant feedback, it's, it's relatively straightforward. But actually our distance learning classroom should be no different to um, the on, uh, to the campus-based ones. So what we therefore need to do for a distance learning community to be established, conditions need to be established to foster these, these four elements. Therefore, our, our pedagogical approach needs to enable and facilitate these facets. So we now must be able to develop spirit, trust, uh, and an interaction within our, within our learning. So how do we do this? So we need to develop, excuse me, online relationships um, and the only ways or, or essentially the tools that we have with the current technology the only real ways to do these are through online seminars and, and online discussion forums and these are these are good vehicles to do this um, and you may already use these and I'm going to hopefully show you a, a, a structure or a framework of how we've helped uh, put these together to facilitate learning. What you will find is that small groups and small group discussions are best. Um, I mean, today we have yeah, 50 odd participants. Um, the opportunity, very much like a, a campus based seminar for interaction there, is limited because of the numbers. Um, certainly some of the, the sessions that I've run previously, somewhere between 12 and, and 20 people uh, is generally, yeah, from my perspective, optimal because you've got the opportunity for discussion, but there's not too many people where individual voices are, are drowned out almost. So we need to, to, to manage these discussions and forums as best we can, but these relationships do take time to develop. A again, it's no different to campus-based uh, relationships and, and rapport. So sometimes this can take over, you know, certainly one semester, but sometimes two or three. So there is no instant win or, or, or quick win with this. So does an online community, can we put it together for, for distance learning? Well, yes, we can. 
Um, Shuri et al. in 2018 found that online quizzes, discussion forums uh, and reflection exercises dramatically improved and significantly improved module satisfaction uh, and personal self-efficacy uh, above uh, any kind of passive, almost didactic online delivery. Um, Jiang uh, et al. in 2019, fairly recently, um, found that, that formative assessment allows that validation of, of progress yeah, for us to be able to give feedback but as teaching staff, but also for peers to be able to give feedback and comment on, on formative work of, of um, contributions by individuals, uh, and improves emotional state, improves self-efficacy, and, and actually has an impact on the, the ultimate you know, goal, the learning outcomes of the student. Um, and what they also found is that if we link discussion forum interaction to assessment weighting, so if there's some way we can link it into our formal assessments, our summative assessments, this engages, increases engagement even further. So there, there is opportunity for, for, for interaction through quizzes, through forums, uh, through online forums to improve our, our emotional state, feeling of our, our belonging, that identity with a community. Um, Jerry in 2017, let me just move myself out of the way there. Um, concurs with this as well. Um, yeah, the interactive elements, um, quizzes, multiple choice, those kind of things within videos and within digital um, delivery actually improves that engagement uh, of videos by, by 22 and 25% respectively for what they class as short videos, uh, sort of under 11 minutes, uh, and for longer videos as well. So adding that opportunity for students to engage somehow, even if it is on their own, um, if they're, they're, they're doing this as a um, standalone piece of work, improves the learner experience. So um, how do we do these things? Um, like I mentioned earlier, there's, there's, there's certainly no right or wrong answer with, with any of this. Um, and you know, a lot of this is, is trial and error because you know, maybe because of the COVID situation, this has been accelerated. Um, but you know, people are gradually finding their feet with, with this, this technology and, and this pedagogical approach to learning um, because it is different. It has evolved over the last five or 10 years with, with technology being available. Um, all I would say is, as with many things, variety is the spice of life. So, you know, a, a, a single approach to how you deliver uh, online materials and try to create that sense of community. Um, you need a variety of options to keep people engaged. Yeah, not just for your standard, you know, teaching pedagogical uh, you know, theories of learning where you know, we need to um, address and, and um, uh, What's the word I'm looking for? Um, and, and cater for people's uh, d delivery preferences and learning styles and, and those kind of things. But it, it helps massively with, with the online community side of things. Um, and one of the ways to do this is to have a mixture of synchronous and, and asynchronous delivery. So stuff that is, is ready for learners to access at their convenience. You know, we, we live in a society that is used to accessing things w when they wish. You know, when was the last time you, you, know, you looked at a TV guide and thought, right, I'm going to wait till eight o'clock on a Friday night to sit down and watch X, Y, and Z? You know, we don't do that anymore. You know, Netflix, yeah, Amazon Prime, all of those kind of platforms. It is you know, that kind of instant satisfaction, instant gratification world that we live in. So, so the use to being able to allow people to dip into materials when they like, um, as well as having some um, programmed in uh, materials it is important from my point of view. So what I'd like to do then, the, the crux of, of the session really is to, to, to show you, to, to give you a, a guided tour, for want of a better phrase, of, of a structure that we use um, within the School of Education to deliver our online materials, which is certainly over the last 18 months has, has, has yielded much more um, positive feedback from, from learner surveys um, and also anecdotal conversations uh, from the students as well. And, and in kind of spontaneous feedback really <clears throat> in terms of you know, creating that sense of community and for people to be involved. Now the students that we have on there are, are volunteers to distance learning. They signed up for a distance learning course knowing what they were getting themselves into. So the, the engagement uh, I think we could probably uh, again anecdotally say is, is naturally going to be higher than, than maybe some undergrad students at the moment that are you know, for the situation we're in, being forced to being part of a, a, an online community because they, they, they signed up for a campus-based delivery model. Um, but actually, for me, the principle should be the same and, and, and should help increase that engagement uh, and uh, affinity with the programme. So what I'd like to um, sort of show you really is, is 
one of our, our pages. So hopefully this should come up on the screen for you. So we use Moodle uh, as a platform. Um, there are other, uh, other options and products available. The, yeah, there's benefits and limitations to them all. But the general structure that we work to is, is a fairly standard one and a systematic one. So at the be beginning of the page, you have your standard information, welcome module information, um, discussion forums, which I'll come back to in a little while, um, and assessment material. But then what we do is we, we work through the, the, the material, the topic, the subjects uh, content. Now we label them as topics uh, and we work through Moodle books to, to go through. And again, there's benefits and pitfalls to those. Um, I know there's other um, uh, platforms out there which offer different uh, uh, you know, um, potential, but this is the one we have. So we, we follow those through. We generally tend to have um, a 10, um, sorry, beg your pardon. There we go. Um, a 10 uh, topic um, sort of list within each uh, uh, module that we do so that students know exactly how many they're going through and, and the elements are in there. Um, in terms of modes of delivery, there is a, there is a variety of what we do and I'm going to dip into these in, in just a second. Uh, let me get back to this. So there's a variety of uh, material. Of the 10, uh, what we tend to have is four of the topics are a mixture of presented video uh, and text, which I'll demonstrate a few in a second. The next four, or not necessarily the next four, but another four are a mixture of narrated video uh, and text. Uh, and then we have as two as online seminars, uh, which are live for the students to, to dip into. Um, and within each of these topics, um, within each of the Moodle books that we have, there are reading, discussion forum activities, quizzes, case studies. Yeah, we use LinkedIn Learning, which is quite helpful as, a, uh, as just a, a sporadic thing, just to set scene, scenes on some of the uh, material. Um, and some other external material, yeah, things like the, the, the TED Talks, the Khan Academy, et cetera, which uh, are all useful and, and helpful. So if I show you one, um, so you have to bear me a second. This is a, I find WebEx a little bit clunky um, as we go. So if I show you one of the um, pages, you know, you're going to have to forgive the gurning. Um, one of the pitfalls of creating online videos and, and for YouTube that we do is there's only a selection of thumbnails that you can have. And a little bit of my soul dies every time I know that someone sees these. So you can see the interesting screen captures that they have of you as you, as you go through. So yeah, just be aware of that. There's not a lot you can do. So in terms of um, the delivery, then we have, um, like I mentioned, four of the topics where there are um, a mixture of videos and, and written feedback. So just to give you an example of one of the pages, there's a video that we have here um, going through the contents. We deliver the information. There's some contextual information via text here. And then there's activities and readings for the students to do. Um, so it's all linked in together. So when the students uh, wish to, they can watch the videos. Hopefully this will play. I'm not sure how the sound will go. Um, we tend to keep the videos fairly short, but I'll, I'll talk through that in a second. Um, but we offer um, different elements and instructional uh, points as, as, as we go. So uh, if I just flip through some of these, so hopefully we offer some thoughts, some transitions um, as we go, and then the students can work through the, the, the written material and then contribute to the discussion forums. Um, in terms of a good example of how we put together the discussion forums, um, after somebody's um, been part of a conversation or part of a, a video, um, to give you an example here. So the students work through the materials um, and there's a discussion around which they can post to the forums if they wish uh, and a reading. What you'll notice here and hopefully seeing the difference between the two videos uh, is the, the quality of the, the, the production, if that makes sense. So I'm just going to pause it there for a second and go back to my PowerPoint. That's okay. Right. I'm going to go back to the original question, really. Um, why why is there this mythical four minutes um, of attention span for students when they're watching you know, taught material? And, and that's you know, no different for age groups, genders, uh, social groups, nationalities. It tends to be this mythical four minutes. And for me, the main difference, the reason why people can sit down and watch a, a good quality document 
industry, uh, a TV program that, that catches their attention is because of the quality of production. And that, what that means is, is that professional editing can engage the viewers by uh, capturing their attention. Now, what you'll notice is when you watch a, a film or a video, there's transitions all the time. Every sort of six, seven seconds, the, the, the focus of the image changes. It's always moving. It's not just a single, you know, like I'm here now in this bottom corner, single focal point and someone talking. That single focus point, we do struggle to hold our attention with. That, that probably is four minutes at most. But when you watch a professionally edited uh, video, they will engage a lot longer or film for it. In fact, you know, two hours, two and a half, three hours, maybe yeah, we can watch feature films for. Um, and, and the reason why that holds our attention is because of the transitions, the, the, the engagement with it. Um, if I go back, uh, apologies, let me just scroll this one down. Do that video. Uh, apologies, I'm going to have to minimize this one. Just come out of that. There we go. Um, if you have a look at the video here, um, I was fortunate enough to, to be able to utilize a, a, a member of staff from, who can create these kind of videos. So you'll notice that, you know, over that what period are we now? sort of 30 seconds, um, you know, there's, there's headings coming up, there's a change of focus. Um, I appreciate you can't hear the, the, the narrative there. I can assure you it's, 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 it's highly quality content, but you can see that the, the movement of the images, yeah, the change, the text that's coming up on the screen, um, and that makes a difference. So that will, it's certainly not perfect with what we've got there, but it will hold people's attention because of the change of movements. So in that 30 seconds, there was, there was a, a, a good number of, of, of transitions, which can make all the, all the difference. So, uh, like I mentioned, um, you do need to be able to create those high quality digital materials. Now, we do have online learning uh, developers, uh, OCDs across the university that can do that. Um, and it's having the, the skill set to be able to do those, um, uh, the post editing elements. Now, some of it you can do your own. Um, certainly for the um, narrated PowerPoints, which I'll show you in a second, uh, you can do them yourself. Um, the, Retention rate for those, for the videos that I've done, um, are high. Um, it's it's 80 to 90 percent. The so through because we place the videos on YouTube, um, we can see the Google Analytics for them. So for any length of video, I think the longest I've done is 14 minutes. Um, almost consistently, the the view time or the retention is. Uh, YouTube call it is almost you know ninety percent in some cases. Most of the time it's sort of mid eighties. So they're they're watching a huge proportion of of material. Um, I think it's uh, the research by Jerry. Um, when they look at theirs, their their uh, engagement is somewhere around sixty percent. So it, it's difficult to compare because you know, obviously I haven't seen the videos that they created for their the research for their study. But that in, that transition and that professional element does increase the retention uh, yeah, massively from from students. Let me show you the um, online, uh, sorry, narrated PowerPoints um, in terms of how they work as well. Um, this is, I, I produced this using Camtasia. Um, and again, you can, you can utilize this. It's fairly straightforward software. It takes a little while to get used to, um, but you can quite easily add in um, animations and changes. So all of this content here, uh, again, I appreciate you can't hear the, the, the narrative, but the, the changes, the movements, the, the transitions as you go through help keep people's attention. Um, as I go through, yeah, there's, there's different videos, uh, sorry, different um, headings you can put up. Uh, and within reason, it's quite easy to, to animate these videos you can see here that the, the, the image is moving slightly and slowly again it just holds people's attention whilst you're giving uh, information it holds their focus so the next time you watch a, a really good documentary maybe on bbc4 or, or you know, other channels are available um just have, be conscious of how they're doing the the backgrounds you know the images especially the historical uh, documentaries are very good at that yeah they have a painting or a, um, a mosaic or whatever and the, the screen will move slightly as it's being narrated so in the layout and the way we we develop things um it's very much videos that are narrated powerpoints that are narrated um as a mixture as our as our kind of core and then the uh 
so they're the, if you like, the, the delivery of information comes through from there. You know, your, your lecture side, the information, the, 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 the basics, the foundations go via those, those, those mediums. And then what we do is to, to move people up to the higher order thinking skills that the, um, to move people into, uh, you know, analysis, evaluation, you know, above the kind of comprehension and, and knowledge side of things, that's where we pose the questions and we, we have the forums and, and, and readings. So in terms of the forums that we have, um, again, to make things straightforward and simple for students, what we what we do is we link them um, to any activity or, or um, discussion that, that you that you put on the, the Moodle page. So can if I show you a, a, an example, so as the students work through um, the videos, uh, I'll give you a sort of quick run through from here. So yeah, the, the students um, will work through the Moodle book on the right hand side. So you have a selection of videos, um, just give them some information. Again, another wonderful gurning picture. Um, a little bit of my soul's just died again. Um, moving forward, this one's not without, without me on it. So they work through the videos uh, and the elements. Um, Maybe the odd reading as they go through there as well, and then they'll they'll come to a, a point where they they have an activity to do, and there's a link there for the forum. So they click on that um, and they go into the forum. So the students can can post and they can work through each other. Now this uh, this is a live unit actually, so it's been been going what just over a couple of weeks, really. um, and you can see there's uh, what's that a good sort of seven or eight nine students that have, have discussed um, and they're replying to each other as as they go. So if we look at um, uh, a policy here we flick through there's some details so the students have, have done some wonderful research and answered the question tony's replied to to um that's right emily there yeah so they're they're, they're relating they're collaborating there there's um interaction with people's thoughts and this enables them to validate their progress so they know whether they're on the, the in the right path whether they know whether they're going in the right direction but also they know if they're not and they can you know very simply and very easily dip into these um moodle forums and think ah, actually yeah that's given me a really good idea or oh no I was, I was miles off there so that that validation of learning is is really really important let me back appreciate this is a lot of me giving information um like i mentioned i've There'll be opportunities for some questions a bit in the way. I've seen that things have been flashing up and I'll, I'll address those as we go. Um, just a couple more really. Um, there's an interaction interactive element of this as well. Um, within Moodle, there's there's plenty of options and, and uh, other elements that you can, can utilize. Um, I tend to make the interactive tasks linked to the video. Now you can link them within the videos if you like, um, but that's a little bit beyond my um, expertise. Let's show you, give you an example of um, an interactive video. What I'll try and do is, is this might sound a bit tinny, but I'm going to try and give you the um, sound for this one. Uh, so bear me a second. So. So I've given them a, a little bit of a, a prompt, and then there's another video here. I could use a worksheet, I suppose, of this, and the students work through that. Uh, and then once they've had their go, they can work through here, um, and they'll have the, the different answers uh, as we go. So there's an element of, of activity for those for those students to do uh, as they go. Uh, Um, and lastly, but not least, really, um, is the is the online seminars. Um, I think these are a, a real, really important part of creating that sense of community because it gives people the opportunity to come together as 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 a group, as a as, as a as a cohort, really, uh, and enable them to discuss and, and share information. Now, as I mentioned before, this can be a bit of a challenge if students are in different time zones across the world um, because of uh, of times, but also because of internet issues, those kind of things. So sometimes you, we certainly have, we certainly offer uh, two sessions around our, our our seminars to enable students to to, to join in. 
Um, there's no real difference in, in terms of the way we set up our, our online seminars as you do campus based. Um, but as an aside, uh, Wolverton offers a really interesting framework as to how to structure online seminars, um, which I'll, I'll pop a reference list at, at the end. Um, but that's worth having a look in, in terms of following that. Um, pretty much what we do on the MSc uh, in education follows that um, that program, that structure that, that they've given. Um, so if I'll give you an example. Um, so within the, the topic, within the module that we offer, there'll be two online seminars for two different topics. Um, we give the students some details uh, around when it's going to be. We tend to use Google Meet because we find it's quite intuitive and quite straightforward to, to use. Um, what we do to, to see how many students we're going to have, we set up a, a Doodle survey uh, beforehand where you um, ask the students just to, to select a, a, a date, which they can do. Hopefully they kick in, here we go. So they can select which session they're, they're going to jump into. So you've got a bit of an idea as to how many you're going to have um, in your session. And then they click to join whichever one uh, on the day. The way we've structured them um, to help the, not necessarily the engagement, but the flow of the discussion really is we've we've set a, a reading um, and then we have some some prompts and questions to go really, which again is no different to to, to wait how we may structure campus-based seminars anyway. But what we tend to do is is almost take uh, in terms of facilitating the discussion and posting questions because you don't have that. Um, the, the sort of physical cues that you get within a, a classroom based environment or a seminar based environment on the campus where you can see whether someone is ready to answer or they're happy to you don't quite get that on the video um, we almost need to go back to and we sort of do it as a bit of a joke really kind of a primary school so, um, aspect so what we do is we, we wait for people to ask and throw out questions uh, sorry we throw out questions and either wait for someone to put their hand out to ask which works quite well if you've got a, a system uh, like with, with Google Meet where you can see the, the videos of everyone um, or we throw out a nominated question to someone but with the caveat that you know, there, there's no judgments made if you're in a position where you can't answer that question you just say no I can't and you throw it back so it does it does take a little bit of juggling and no doubt most of you will have uh, been in that situation over the last oh, few months maybe with COVID um, but it tends to work quite well as long as you give them a structure of here's our reading here's some the questions so they can prepare the material to take away that anxiety of being put on the spot with with peers that they might not have met before um, that first time the last thing you want to do is, is single someone out and make them feel um, inadequate or, or exposed really so within the reading uh, sorry within the seminars as well we offer further reading for the students should they wish to, to take it um, further um, oh sorry I've just seen one of the questions pop up um, from William there about visible I, I find it hugely beneficial to have to see people, uh, to see the, the visuals. Um, which I'm struggling a little bit with the WebEx today because when I present it, it takes my screen down to, and I, I can only see four videos. Um, with other, I'm sure you can do it with WebEx, but you, with other uh, platforms, you can see everyone across your tiles. Now, obviously, the more you have, the smaller people get, um, but you can, to some certain extent, start to take some visual cues um, from people as to whether they want to answer um, or as to whether they're, they're actually thinking no, that that question's not for me, really. Okay. Um, so it, it's a bit whistle stop, really, in terms of creating a, a sense of community there. But certainly for for us on the um, MSC program, that structure of online delivery in terms of videos, narrated PowerPoints or narrated videos to give people information, then the opportunity to discuss uh, and validate their thoughts uh, and work within discussion forums complemented with with a number of online seminars tend to tends to work really really um, well with us um, I've just seen another question pop up so what I'm going to do is not share my screen if that's right for a second um, and see if I can get back to the Webex page um, to answer some of those questions so, uh, Okay, so uh, Andy, you might need to guide me slightly here. Let me just get the chat up. Okay. And, Thanks okay. Thanks for that. That is a brilliant session. Thank you. Right. Got lots of comments coming. Can you see the comments, Richard, or would you like me to read them out? Are you all right there? Yeah, I'm all right there. Well, I'll, if everyone's okay, I'll, I'll start at the top. Was it uh, Anthony at 
1019 at work down is that if, if everyone's absolutely and then people keep jumping keep chipping in as you see fit colleagues please uh, so i'm just going to move my screen around just so i can have a better view okay wonderful um so uh small so and anthony writes uh small groups for discussion seminars work best but any tips for linking these together to ensure members of the group interact with each other that's a really good point actually and um, i've found that they they almost do that um organically um the, the, the it's, a, it's an interesting one it's, it's almost like seating children in class i come from a teaching background so yeah do you do you group students or, or pupils in different groups and then change them around each week when you teach them to to develop that that rapport and relationship with other people or do you let people do it naturally or organically and do you let them find their own groups and actually they feel more comfortable in those it's a real um dichotomy really um for me i i, I tend to let it happen organically because my students are um uh, mature learners uh, generally um professionals working in the education industry is is um, what they've tended to do at the end of the seminars we've had is a lot of them I've kind of prompted and said that yeah one of the key things about the course you're on at the moment is that it's the wonderful flavor you can get from the eclectic mix of people from from all over the world that you're, you're working with you know in terms of networking this is a wonderful uh, opportunity for you um, and I prompt them kind of through official channels I you know do it through the Moodle forums you know post because we have question and answer forums sort of outside of the topics but for the modules to say look if anyone wants to to group together and become a you know a, a sort of friendship group i suppose or professional friendship group then do so uh, and i know a few students have, have done that because uh they set up a few whatsapp groups you know not that we're involved in but that they are and then they start to create their own community outside um and then they tend to find that they um, interact with each other outside of the seminars um which i think works really well the, the difficulty i have with with students all over the world um it's the time zones so mixing the groups tends to be a bit of a challenge um but that that kind of works for for us um okay uh anthony's the next one uh on campus students are split small two groups okay yeah that's makes sense Matthew. can students take and record notes during uh sessions in moodle um that's sort of uh y yes in terms of um for the recorded uh, material whether they can save that into moodle itself um i'm not sure is the honest answer i think they tend to do that via their own um uh, sort of mediums whether that's yeah the good old-fashioned yeah, notebook and pen and paper um or um uh, yeah, word or google docs or whatever it may be um in terms of them answering questions in the moodle in terms of the forum yes they capture that there but like i meant i showed for one of the interactive tasks i generally don't tend to ask them to input it into moodle um they can do that themselves and whatever works best for, for them um Charlie to everyone, uh, could you offer some examples of the kind of embedded formats assessments that work well? Um, you refer to tutoring and feedback. How do you capture feedback? Okay. Um, if I can answer question two first from, from Charlie at 10.24. Um, in terms of peer feedback in the virtual setting, um, the forums capture that uh, themselves in those, those written forums. Um, in terms of the online seminars that we have, um, we don't tend to capture those, those um, uh, interactions uh, for want of a better descri description um, there are options around you know peer assessments uh, formative peer assessments which certainly from from my background as a teacher were very very powerful with students it's not something I've implemented um, as part of any distance learning delivery at the moment but I think it could be could be powerful um, in terms of embedded formative assessments that we've used um, the Moodle quizzes tend to be to, to be quite useful um, certainly for that module that I've showed up there we, we haven't used them in those but because we use them um, we use them quite a lot in the next uh, module uh, and the one previously you can set it up um, with the OCDs where students can't move on from one topic to the next until they've completed a formative yeah, uh, quiz or assessment which, which works quite well uh, again variety is important I wouldn't necessarily do that for every module but for, for one or two uh, I think it works um, quite nicely um, one from Sue. Uh, who is a member of staff who helped you create the high quality video? Um, the <laughs> I don't want to give you individual people's names because they might be um, uh, swamped with with custom. Um, uh, Sue, it's one of the um, OCDs that we work with as part of 
our interactions, if that makes sense. I hate to be covert, but um, if you speak to your OCDs across your, your faculties and departments, um, that they'll be able to point you in the right direction there. Um, I've used a number um, because of a bit of a cross university role that I have. Um, and like everything, some people are stronger with the, the, the post, uh, post editing side of things. Um, I tend to, I'm a little bit self taught with Camtasia. So if you, there's some things I can do, but it's, it's just worth having a play. It does take time. Um, but it's 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 worth speaking to the OCDs and speaking to the individual people that can do things. I mean, if you go to the faculty OCDs, they can record the green screen behind you, um, but you almost need to be your own director. So you almost need to say, right, can I have two cameras set up? I'm going to speak a little bit into this one here, a little bit into that one there, um, and and almost have in your own mind when you want the transitions, when you want images coming in, which I think is one of the reasons why we only tend to have short videos um, because the logistics of producing them take a lot of time. Um, in terms of software, the video, I use Camtasia. Um, I asked for the, my head of department for a, an upgraded license rather than the, the standard one we get from Apps Anywhere uh, because it just offers a few features. Um, I find it very intuitive, very easy to use. Uh, I know Adobe, um, is it Professional Pro? Something like that uh, offers exactly the same thing, really. Um, but there's so much out there on the market, it's just worth having a, a try. But I'd certainly say Camtasia is, is very good and very intuitive um, and go from there. Um, tips on the technology kit at home. Um, I would say in terms of the videos, if you, if you take I produce a script because I found it very difficult just to do things off the cuff. Um, the moment you set yourself up and the red light goes on and record, I can't remember my own name, let alone what I'm supposed to be saying. So I tend to have a bit of paper that sits underneath the, the camera lens and I'll, I'll read off the script that I've prepared, um, which is not, isn't great, but it's, you know, it's what Ant and Deck do. So I'm, I'm happy with that. Um, the recording doesn't take long, you know, to, to put together the material actually is, is the short bit. Um, yeah, if you, if you gave yourself, an hour for half an hour's worth of recording that's that's plenty um absolutely loads um but it's the post editing for i would say for every minute of good quality editing you're going to do it takes about 45 minutes to an hour when you start off um you, you gradually get faster but the i think you find that the, the better you get with it and the more things you start to play with the more things you put in place which means they take longer naturally but i would say yeah for every minute of video if you are allowed an hour all in sound a bit like a builder doing an estimate here um that, as a rule of thumb i would i would say that works um next one down at 10 28 uh, i have an ipad pro and apple pencil uh can oh that's yeah interactive whiteboard monday, okay so andy's running a workshop on the ipad stuff on monday that, yeah that'd be worth getting to i must admit I'm, I've, i don't tend to i've never used apple but i know that the um creative uh, members of staff uh, do so that i think that's the best way of doing it um, nice to use Windows. Uh, so Frank's asked, are we allowed access to this Moodle page? Um, the short answer is uh, potentially. I'd need to request it from our um, uh, IT team. Um, uh, our online course developers within the department. But if anyone wants to email me uh, after the session, I'm more than happy to to answer questions or, or where possible, give you access to Moodle pages. Uh, Richard, can I just intervene there? We we are doing a lot of work, as you probably know. There's a big uh, online learning push coming for colleagues, probably in about a couple of weeks' time, where we are looking for exemplar kind of like modules. Richard, we could, if there's a possibility, we might be able to clone that module um, and put it as a kind of like uh, a copy so people could actually come in and look at it without um, interrupting the work that you may need to do on it. Might that be possible? Yeah, more than happy for that, more than happy for that. I mean, it, like I mentioned, it's not a, you know, it's not an immaculate, you know, um, design and it's not, doesn't, you know, fit fit for everyone, but yeah, more than happy for people to use it. As well, a, I would, that would be really, really helpful. Thank you. No worries. Um, Moving on to the next one. So from William about the, um, does it make a difference if you're visible or, or not? Um, 
For online uh, seminars, absolutely, I would say so. Um, in terms of videos of yourself delivering information, uh, again, I think it's a bit of a variety. I think to build that relationship and rapport with students, to be able to physically see you, I think is important um, because you know, we're human beings, it's a, a natural instinct for us. So I think it does make a difference, uh, but it doesn't have to be all the time. Uh, and again, if you go back to good quality documentaries that you see, yeah, the presenter will be on it you know, 30, 40, 50% of the time, maybe. So I think that as, as long as you've got a mixture, that's, that's important. Um, in terms of GDPR issues around students being recorded, I certainly don't record the online seminars um, just because of that. Uh, I know Google asks you if, if um, uh, you've got permission for people to be recorded, if you record it, I'm, and I'm sure it would be fine. But I think for me, it's also the engagement. Yeah, there's a bit of me that doesn't want students to know that there's a recording available for them to look at later. If and I'm maybe thinking, and I may be a bit in a bit stereotypical here, but maybe for more for undergrads that might think, oh, I just won't bother interacting. I'll watch it later. So I think that, that detracts from the, the 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 quality of the conversation and discussion and debate. So I I don't almost aside from GDPR as well, I don't record seminars just to encourage engagement. You know, we give them enough opportunities to to, to get involved um, through different time zones. So that's that's fine. Uh, Lucy, in terms of platform for online seminars, everyone has their own preferences. Um, a lot of my colleagues use Slack, um, which is very similar to Zoom and Google Meet and, and WebEx. I think it's whatever you're, you, you prefer. Um, they're all much of a muchness, but yeah, like anything, the format's slightly, slightly different. Um, ah, somebody's put the link to uh, Wolverine's work, which is wonderful. Do you use breakout groups? Uh, at all. A uh, question from Sarah. Um, I haven't so far. Um, no, I know a colleague, uh, a number of colleagues of mine do for their seminars um, with their, their undergrads and, and certainly uh, with uh, yeah, the last few weeks and months with uh, with COVID. Um, I know you can set that up with with WebEx. I don't know if you can set that up with with Zoom and with, with Google uh, Meet. So, I mean, that's the dichotomy around which you know which platform do you use really um i certainly haven't used break, breakout groups um as i've gone but i know they 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 have been used within our department within our school of education sociology um and, and they've been very well um well received um so it's it's worth i think it's worth trying there's pedagogically there's a little bit more in terms to do to do in terms of the logistics um because you'd have to work out who's going where and 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 uh, not the invites necessarily, but pop them out into the different groups. But I don't think, from what I've heard from my colleagues, I don't think it's uh, particularly challenging or, or, or taxing. Um, yeah, J James Smith um, recommends Camtasia as well. I, I quite agree. Um, uh, so from Charlie, I can see how your mature learners and senior visit group has come through for your until skin. Yeah, it's. Uh, I, I feel your pain uh, in terms of engagement. You know, in a face-to-face -face environment, Charlie. In terms of undergrad students, um, looking at the research and for the life of me, I can't remember the the, the authors. Um, but I read something a few months ago that you know, if you get 50% engagement in a in an online seminar, um, you've done well. Um, which I think is 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 good for rule of thumb. Um, it's it is tricky. Um, I think it's like anything, any kind of teaching. You'll have students that are conscientious, have a good work ethic, are proactive, that will will become engaged. Others won't. Um, I think as time goes by and potentially the world moves more to a, a virtual classroom environment, um, I think it's it will become more uh, natural for people to be involved. But I, I think that's going to to take time. Um, I would say I would set your stall out early. So I'd get a uh, an online seminar in right at the beginning of the year when the students are still keen and you know fresh as week is is not a distant memory. <coughs> Excuse me. So that the students are. Are, they still have that motivation to learn at the moment. They haven't completely fallen into the undergrad tra trap. So if you can get them and show them that it's worthwhile, I think you you would capture capture more. Um, Premier Pro, yeah, Craig mentions Premier Pro, uh, which is yeah definitely use, useful uh, and resources. Any tips on that? Uh, okay, so from James at ten forty eight. Uh, any tips on viewing interacting with materials compulsory? Uh, in ensuring engagement. Yes, you, um, I mean, you'd have to go for your associate head academic in terms of changes to your module. Um, but the research has shown that if you link interactions to the forums, interactions to seminars with um, assessment, uh, summative assessment weighting, then then obviously engagement increases. I would certainly only keep that as a, as a small percentage of the weighting because 
the the difficulty is is how do you market how do you you know the dangers of online discussion and debate almost becoming a bit of a uh, uh, not an academic piece is is a challenge um so i would certainly keep it as a, a small an element as possible but even if you you, know, you you look around it's the contribution so it's you know i don't know five percent of the weighting of the the module is that students have engaged and commented on somebody else's post so it's it's almost an arbitrary yes they've had a go within reason the quality of it isn't isn't an issue but have they contributed um and offer them a small weighting for that because that in turn would feed into the you know the the other elements of assessment because you know by, almost by proxy they'd be be learning they'd be interacting with the materials um So William uh, at 10.50, we still have a timetable in mind, such as a timetable for certain times because of the normal campus space. Are you suggesting we break the habit so we can offer occasional seminars so people can sign up for them? Um, that's, a, uh, that's an interesting one. I would, I mean, certainly for UK-based students, and if you're thinking about undergrads, I would, I think structure works well um, and where you're, I mean, we. I mean, it's 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 almost unknown territory, isn't it? I mean, could we say that seminars on a on a Wednesday night at seven o'clock are more uh, appropriate for for students um, at, at the current moment, where some of them might have taken you know, part time work in supermarkets during the day, or would they be working more in the evenings? Um, in terms of timetable, it's it's a difficult one. You'd have to know your students, know your cohort, know generally what they would would prefer. Um, certainly for my students, it has to be evenings, and and uh, um, for them, uh, depending on where they are, time zone wise. So the seminars could be midday, could be four o'clock, could be you know, uh, eight o'clock in the evening. It all just depends, really. Uh, I wouldn't. Like if I may, sorry, just because it's one of the discussions we're having in DCQ at the moment. I think there's the guidance around some of this kind of like coming but it's this notion if, if, you, if we're going online and you may have seen graham's email this morning saying that stuff that was face to face will be online if we stick into a timetable structure it's perhaps within that timetable how you're using that time so if you are flipping the sessions around and students are doing stuff more remotely it may be you're looking at how you use that timetable slot to perhaps break the students down and bring them in for this group to group uh, relational stuff, a really interesting uh, article I think, in either THE or The Guardian this week, which really captures what Rich has been talking about this morning about the relation element and the face to face is, is going to be still just as important about the about what we actually deliver as well. So there's there's news, there's resources coming from DCQE and tell very shortly that we'll provide some additional guidance around this. So you'll see that within the next couple of weeks. Yeah, definitely, and and I think it's it's very much a moving feast, isn't it, over the next uh, few weeks and months, not just for for us, but for education in general, really. I mean, I've got two young lads, and the schools trying to um, you know, trying to put things in place for for them is is a challenge. And and again, like I think like I mentioned before, for me, there's no right or wrong, and and I think yeah, Andy, that's great. If the university have got a uh, you know, um, uh, what's the word? Uh, a direction for us to follow and some some guidance for us to utilize and that makes absolute sense yeah um and it's certainly in terms of when you timetable things and when we utilize these different resources um yeah i think it's going to be a movable feast and i think we're going to learn a lot over the next few few weeks and months um and could be some interesting research that can can go on i know there's there's people in my department that are keen to to look at things um i appreciate that's been quite whistle stop and and very quick actually um are there any other um questions uh okay yeah okay so asynchronous activities from different model module sorry uh, is there a weekly limit for different modules or time limits okay that's interesting um i think again it, it just depends on and forgive me andy if i'm going uh, this is just my perception rather than there might be some university guidance in terms of what works best for, for students um but i would i would certainly say um i, I would almost follow the almost the 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 program you have at the moment so you know if you think about breaking down the lecture time that you would have had as you kind of videos narrated powerpoints as a rough rule of thumb and then any seminars tutorial workshops practicals labs etc 
as the uh, as the discussion based elements, which are, are yeah are more synchronous. Um, I would, as a general rule of thumb, I'd look to to mirror what the the original program was with with how you would do it now. Um, I wouldn't necessarily like with anything any teaching uh, activities, resource, and techniques. I wouldn't just focus on a single one. Uh, I think there needs to be a good mix of, of all, uh, like I mentioned before. So I, as a rule of thumb, I would look to, to model what you have existing uh, with the timetable campus space for, for lectures and seminars, et cetera, at the moment, uh, and see how it goes. You know, if the students respond more to the um, materials that are o o online uh, for them to access at their convenience, then maybe shift a little bit more towards that. But if if students prefer the, the live delivery uh, and the interaction, then 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 go that way. I think I think you've nailed that on the head. It's exactly what I would have said. Don't. I think the most important thing is start with what you've got. There is a tendency at the moment to think you've got to reinvent reinvent everything again, and you don't. Take a session, think about what it looks like on a weekly basis, and then think to yourself, right, how can I deliver elements of this online? And what you'll find is some elements are perhaps easier to deliver online, so you can focus on that as perhaps a synchronous element. Some of the bits aren't, and then you might you might flip that over. Like I said, there's a lot of guidance on this about coming out very i'm working on a lot of guides to active blended learning at the moment which effectively uh we're working on so again just watch this space but i think richard's hitting the nail on the head think about what you're doing already um and 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 but the other analogy i use when we're talking about active blended learning is a bit like the old-fashioned sweetie shop and it's a pick and mix approach and you think about what you want to achieve in a session and then you're using different tools and techniques to deliver that across a module so it's not i think the most important thing with online delivery it's not necessarily the same thing every week there's a nice blend emerging that keeps that level of engagement going uh and the structure of richard's pages with all the with the icons and that that is something like that is coming but it's really clear and it helps engage because they feel confident and it's really clear what they need to be doing so Lots of really good practice we're talking about today and that you've actually seen. Um, I'm conscious of time and, and I don't know if these um, <laughs> these meetings cut out 11 or if people look at other bits, but I'm happy just to answer the last couple of questions that have, have just come through um, about video editing. Um, I must admit, the, there's some really good, I mean, the world is is, is going this way, but YouTube do, and um, Camtasia themselves do some really good tutorials uh, to go through how to edit materials as you go. So I would certainly say that's a really good point of call um, as a start point in terms of how to capture and edit videos. Um, software up and, and running it's quite intuitive um and i know it's easy to, to say but not always so easy to do but the, the the guidance through camtasia is 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 quite useful um oh i'm happy to pop up the bibliography as well um if that's I'll just pop that on screen now if i can sorry i need to let me just share my screen you should see the references there um, i'm more than hand, help, uh, more than happy to ping those those through actually um if if and he's got a, a distribution dropbox or, or, or email uh, at the end so people can see um the wolverton one at the bottom is the is the key one in terms of just move my uh, is the key one in terms of the framework for online discussion it's it's quite useful um i think it comes from a business uh business teaching background um for in he which is uh which is quite good um and you, and uh, Branch Muller uh, reading as well is, is quite useful in terms of that sense of community. Um, uh, interesting question from James there about subtitles for videos. Um, YouTube will do that for you. Um, sometimes it, it misses the odd word here or there, but if you embed your videos into YouTube to upload them onto uh, Moodle, which I, I find works quite well because the videos are quite big, so popping them in, in Moodle on its own is, is a bit of a, a logistical nightmare. Um, the captions, they, they come up with captions, um, or if you like me, I, I write the script before I record them, um, I just upload that as a PDF uh, in the bottom. Um, but I think certainly for, for international students and students with, with English for, as a second language, uh, it's important um, yeah, because we've all got slightly different dialects and accents, et cetera. So you know, trying to <coughs> piece together the odd word here or there can be a, a struggle for, for, for students and for us. So yeah, it's, it's always worth uh, popping in place for them. So. 
Um, <laughs> Nick, so yeah, <laughs> well, I, I don't disagree. I think the, the, the film study and directing is a is a skill set we're going to need to go forward in the in the digital world. Um, I think the challenge we have is is well with the evolution of, of our young people's skills is that 16, 17 year olds are creating videos, or in fact, 14, 15, 16 year olds are creating videos themselves all the time, which are and just using their phones and the editing software on there, which is of reasonable quality. Um, so their expectations are so much higher now. And and it's it's almost a skill set we need to retrospectively learn. I mean, it's something, yeah, my idea of being creative was was changing the font on a Word document to italic. You know, that, that was as, as good as I got when I started teaching. Um, but the expectation has changed and I think we need to, to uh, adapt to that. Um, I know the university of, uh, in the throes of signing a contract with distance learning provider that will help us create that because it is a, a very, a very difficult um, skill set to master. Um, well, question from Antti in terms of the upload videos. Um, no, my, my uh, YouTube account is the one linked to my uh, UOP email address. So as, um, uh, as part of that there. So yeah, it's not a private personal one. Um, what I do is you, if you, when you upload them, if you set them to unlisted, so no one can search to find them, um, but then you embed the link into your Moodle page so that when they click on the link, it works. So yeah, that keeps keeps things private. Um, like I mentioned, it's it's interesting enough when you yourself watched on videos it is by, by your students, let alone uh, any Tom, Dick and Harry uh, on the internet. So yeah, just have them, make sure you click it as unlisted um, and then, People can access it via the link you place in Moodle, but nowhere else. Okay. Um, I hope that that kind of helps. Or if there's you know any other questions, if anyone wants to to throw them out, you know, uh, my email is just richard.paul at port.ac.uk. So more than happy to answer any questions uh, that people have. Oh. Or, or point people in the direction that, that I went. I mean, most most of the things that, that I've learned are on the back of other people's expertise. And, and you know, for me, a, a good teacher is a, a reflective thief. Um, we see we reflect on what we do, but also we, we see some of the good things that other people do and go, oh, actually, how do I do that? And 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 obviously credit them for it, but yeah, you know, still what they do and the, the methods they use because it's the only way. Yeah, you know, we individual people can't have all the answers. Um, so it's it's certainly worth uh, you know, seeing what other people do uh, across the. The uni and uh, other establishments, um, and, and most people are quite um, amicable, and we'll, we'll, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll happily help and give you the time of day. Which I've, you know, I've, I've only been at the university eighteen months, and I've got to say that you know, most, yeah, you know, almost everyone is 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 welcoming and, and happy to, to help and support, which is uh, which makes all the difference. Is there just I suppose we finished. Was there anything anyone wanted me to just flash up the screen again or any questions on how any of the page was structured? Richard, would I, can I possibly very selfish and ask one uh, at the very end? One of the, uh, first of all, can I thank everybody for the comments? There's lots of really good stuff. Just to say, I can't say too much at this point, but there is an awful lot of guidance coming within the next week about stuff that's going to be put in place for September. So please bear with us. It is coming. It's imminent. We are just putting it together. But once it's released, uh, there, there's a lot of stuff. We're also hoping to run a little learning and teaching festival in July uh, based on lots of small size, bite sized workshops. So any suggestions or things you'd like to put into that? If anybody would like to do something for us as well, that would be great. But Richard, my final question, one of the things we had a chat about this morning is We've got colleagues that in big lecture theatres have large groups and it, and it comes back to this issue of when I think somebody raised it about well, how do you put them into groups at the beginning and um, and somebody raised this do you if you've got a group of 100 do you try and put them in the same groups and, and then set up the, the rooms for them or do you say there's the group and you set those groups perhaps using the group function in Moodle and then let them go off and create their own meets in Google what do you think the best route is to that? Because it seems to be a common starting point for a lot of people because they're teaching large groups. Yeah, that's that's a re really interesting one. Um, I, I can't offer a thought from experience and, and, and personal trial and error, but I would certainly, um, especially in the initial phases and especially in September, because the rapport and relationships for individual students might not necessarily have been been forged and fostered 
I would direct that. I would, I would rather than you know picking teams in primary school when people are playing tag or football or whatever. Um, I think let the, the students pick themselves because you potentially you put yourself in a situation where there's a good number of people that are sat there on their own who who you know don't know anyone and, and find it challenging to to forge those relationships in those groups. Um, and that and, and, and that term in terms of that relationship that spirit that uh, uh, Rovani uh, talks about, it would almost crush that right from the beginning. So I would certainly, certainly for the bigger groups from the from the outset, or certainly initially with, with those kind of breakout groups, I would set those um, so that the students don't feel isolated or exposed or vulnerable. You, you're saying, right, here's your here's your group of 12, go. Here's your group of 12, go. And everyone's in the same boat then. So they're, they're potentially all unfamiliar with each other and they have that opportunity to foster groups rather than the odd student being left out almost um, because they, they don't have the opportunity or, or don't have the, the friendship group at that moment in time, especially if it's distance learning um, to go forward. So yeah, I would always definitely from the beginning, you pick this, the groups and the students go off in those initially. And then you can see how it adapts, you know, if, if, if groups forge over, you know, like I mentioned, those relationships, that sense of community takes a teaching block or two at least, you know, then you can start to say, right now, you can start to pick groups that you're going off in. Um, but it'd be interesting to see how that pans out. Yeah, it's, uh, it's a yeah. difficult one for me. I, I think, like you say, we're very much, it's, it's. I think we're a little bit, I think we're a little bit more advanced than second and C, but it really is an experiential curve roll on. But I think the, the, the ideas, uh, and the enthusiasm, and I have to say, the work that people have put in recently is just absolutely amazing. I, I celebrate my first anniversary at Portsmouth next week, and I think the the work and the is just absolutely amazing. It's been a real privilege to actually see people that are doing some really good stuff. So, I'm Richard. Can I just say thanks? That was given the conversations I've been having with my team this week about the stuff we're doing to support transition. Um, this has been an incredibly timely presentation because it really does articulate and help contextualize some of the things that we've been talking about uh, for our planning. So thank you very much. Got colleagues, this will be recorded. It will be on YouTube uh, and we will post it up because I think it's one that a lot of people need to see because it covers so much ground and has been very helpful. Yeah, uh, thanks very much, Andy. And yeah, thanks for everyone's contributions. And, and if anyone has any questions in the future, yep, yeah, just drop me a line. I'm more than happy to help where I can. Lucy, that's very kind of you. That means an awful lot. We're working really hard. And I don't know about you, but I'm getting a little bit chased off of all these newspaper comments about saying universities are closed when I think university colleagues are working actually harder than ever. So we're here to support. Like I said, Richard's very kindly offered as a sounding board. If anybody needs anything, you're very welcome to email DCQE or please come straight to me directly. And we are here to help people. Please be aspirational. Please be creative. We are here to help you do something really special for September. Um, so, you know, Think outside the box and we can make things happen between us. That's, 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 we'll leave it there. So again, thanks everybody for coming. I really appreciate it. So thanks again. Um, and thank you very much. See you soon. Cheers. Take care.